Hope you guys had a great lunch. A lot of people are still eating. But yeah, so thank you for, for coming back anyway. Uh, without further ado, here is Milos from TomTom. Tom. Uh, Milos is a senior software engineer over there, so he will give a great talk uh, for you guys uh, today. Milos, take it up. Thank you. Thanks. So hi all. Uh, my name is Milos Janovic, as you already heard. I work at TomTom. Tom. Uh, actually, most of my job is related to data science. Uh, and basically, uh, it so happens that pretty much the whole uh, part of my professional career, I was working with these, with like cars, in different uh, uh, aspects. So first, uh, at first, I was for a few years working like uh, in some kind of autonomous driving, uh, doing mostly some kind of like uh, computer vision, navigation, and so on. Uh, but today, I'm working at the TomTom, -tom where we uh, kind of have a different kind of data, that the data is related uh, to location data, and uh, us trying to understand like uh, how can we map the world, so that uh, those maps can be used by both humans and autonomous vehicles. And on the other hand, we want to provide uh, like a navigation solution, so that both of those types of vehicles actually can navigate inside that world. So that's where I'm uh, currently now. But uh, this talk is a bit different than our standard corporate talk, uh, since uh, I would like just to s tell you what could be the subtitles of this talk, so maybe you can understand what I'm going to talk about. And the first thing uh, is that uh, I want to uh, explain you uh, why the heck is this deep learning thing such a breakthrough. You, some, you heard something about it this morning, and I really want to uh, demystify it even more. So the demystification of deep learning is what actually I want to talk. And I want really to demystify one aspect of it, which is uh, what those models actually learn. And uh, also, just to compare uh, two practices. So we have like an old way of doing stuff in like classical machine learning and also we have some kind of like a new way which is those learned representations which you will hear, hear more about uh, during the talk. So uh, here is some uh, as a motivational example. Here's some uh, Facebook post. This is actually a photo of uh, Petnica Science Center in Serbia. I'm also affiliated with that institution where I like volunteeringly uh, lead the department there. Uh, and so this photo is posted on Facebook. And if you go like, like right click and inspect element on it, uh, you might see that an alternative text for this image is something like this. It says image may contain sky, mountains, tree, bridge, outdoor nature, water, and whatever. So you can see that uh, Facebook here is able uh, to understand uh, and uh, name entities within an image. Uh, and what is interesting, they are Facebooks, Facebook, so they are doing this for every image on their service. Pretty much, they are actually deployed some kind of deep learning system at scale uh, and in production, because this is like live. This is on web page of my, uh, my department in the Patent Science Center. So how do we do that? How did we come to this kind of, uh, of stuff? So as you maybe heard uh, this morning, we have this idea of doing, uh, doing this stuff with neural networks. Of course, inspiration came uh, from, from the biological neural networks, although these neural networks which we use as a data scientists or as a software engineers are somewhat different because they are quite more simplified. So I have a range. Okay. Uh, they are uh, quite more simplified, uh, and they are uh, like mathematical models, because what scientists do, they create these kind of models in their free time. So this is like a model of, uh, of neuron. It's actually really simple. It's pretty much just a computational graph. It does some multiplications, additions, and then applies some nonlinearity. And what we can do then uh, is uh, pretty much uh, connect all these neurons in, in one big neural network, and then hopefully the, that model will be able to learn something uh, and do something useful for us. For example, we, we might want to train it uh, to detect faces, which is, uh, which is something else. So here we have like uh, Dennis Ritchie, who is inventor of C language, and he's definitely detected as a face. Uh, and then uh, if I have this uh, uh, Hipcon logo here, uh, it will be detected as not face. So this, there are some kind of like classification tasks, and there are different tasks uh, in machine learning which we can do. And in order to do that, uh, we pretty much just want to give our model uh, uh, a bunch of positive examples, a bunch of negative examples, then apply something which is like called gradient descent or, uh, or similar methods in order to modify this model so it can learn uh, the stuff it needs to learn, so the task at hand. Uh, what is interesting with all this is that this like really revolutionized recently. Pretty much like uh, these three guys here, these are Joshua Bengio, Geoffrey Hinton, and Jan Lecun, uh, got the, Turing, the latest Turing Award 
uh, in computer science, this is like a very prestigious award. For example, the aforementioned Dennis Ritchie got one for inventing C. Uh, they got it for, for these kind of claims. So look at this. It says, for conceptual engineering breakthroughs that have made deep neural networks a critical component of computing. It's like a really bold claim regarding uh, deep neural networks. And that's why I want to explain what's inside that black box of deep learning and try to get it a bit closer to you as engineers. So let's see some, some problem. This is one very hard problem. This problem is called semantic segmentation. So we have an image on the left side, and the task is to assign to each pixel of that image a label that has some semantical meaning, such as, for example, these pixels belong to a horse, uh, these belong to a human, uh, these belong to like a grass or a bank ground or whatever you like. So how you might approach this problem? Uh, and where, where, where the deep learning power comes from. For example, you can uh, first pose it as a classification problem. You can just extract some patches from that image and say, okay, let me just uh, classify the central pixels of each of these patch patches that are extracted. Uh, and how do you create a classifier? You, you just input this stuff inside the, some kind of a classification model, which can be a neural network, but it it might be something else. And hopefully in the output you will get a horse, a grass, or whatever you like. And here comes uh, the main point. Uh, now we have two, uh, two ways of doing stuff. Uh, one way is like the classical way. That's how people have done this for like three decades. The aforementioned uh, three guys and the winners of the Turing Award were actually doing this kind of deep learning uh, or classical learning even uh, for like three decades at least. And that's how, how, this is how you usually uh, think about the problem. Uh, what, what an engineer does, it, it, he tries or she to engineer the features that might be representative of the problem they want to solve. For example, if you want to classify these patches uh, into like a grass or horse or whatever, you might say, okay, maybe this green color and this brown color is very important. Important. So you just index those colors uh, and uh, giving like values. So this is like an average value of a green, and this is like an average value of a brown color inside a particular patch. You input that to your model and hope that it will learn something from it. And this is the, like the old way of doing it, where a human handcraftedly created these features. But w where the parad paradigm changed is that now, when we do deep representation learning, actually the model also learns the classification, but also learns the features themselves, which is like a real shift in this, in this regard. Uh, and th that's like the, the, the main thing that like happened uh, in pretty much at this point, at the year 2012, uh, when uh, two, two factors came into, into the equation. One factor was uh, the availability of large-scale labeled data set, and on the other hand, we had enough computing power and understanding of how to actually use it uh, and apply it to these kind of problems. So in 2012, here comes this guy called uh, Alex Kizhevsky, uh, who uh, published this scientific paper. Also, you see Geoffrey Hinton, Hinton is, al <coughs> is also signed into it. Uh, and uh, pretty much they created uh, a necessary step in order for deep learning to come into a focus. For example, uh, look at this uh, challenge. This is, this is something which is called ImageNet. ImageNet is a classification challenge where you have like a millions of images and you want to classify them in, into a thousand classes. So it's like an immensely hard problem. And before 2012, the best algorithms, which were also some kind of classical machine learning, were around 25% error. But then this small blue dot there, I'm just going to circle it now, uh, is uh, the, the performance of deep uh, representation learning convolutional neural network developed by we called AlexNet. So they, they reduced it to 15%. Uh, and then year by year, deep learning models got it better, better, and better. And what is interesting is that actually human level on this task, it's here. It says uh, it's around uh, like a 5 or 6% error rate. And we now already have some kind of uh, deep learning models that can actually surpass human level uh, perception in these, in, these, in these tasks. So uh, there are some main points. Uh, uh, what, what I want to, you to learn from these like presentations. Uh, firstly, that if, if you are uh, going to be or already are some kind, uh, somehow involved in, in deep neural networks, or you are like engineer, scientist, or whatever, the most important thing is to understand what those uh, models learn. Uh, 
And then uh, you want to uh, see, uh, apply this kind of uh, representational learning. So not, you don't want to uh, hand in engineer your features, but you actually want to learn them from the data. And that will also help you to understand uh, what uh, a network learn. You will see that uh, a bit more later. And the most important thing is that uh, in this kind of a job, uh, you must demystify the model you have at hand in order to be able to improve it. Because today, as you saw, uh, it's pretty easy actually to create a deep learning model. You can do it in 10 lines of code, as my colleague from the university uh, showed this morning. So, but it's a black box. And in order to really apply it to, to, to like your use cases, uh, you have to demystify it. And I'm just going to give you a step toward it, so you can, you can know what, what would you search uh, for when you try to demystify what these models do. So uh, let's just start with some very basic things. Uh, maybe uh, not all of you know this, so that's why I want to just uh, make, make some basics. So uh, let's see what is an image filter. So if you're not in computer vision or image processing, uh, you might think of this, like this is your image filter. So this is your Instagram, and it can filter your images somehow. And this kind of uh, uh, understanding of what image filter is not that bad. It's actually OK. But I'm going to talk about a, a bit different filters. Uh, these are called uh, linear filters. Uh, that's when like this linear algebra comes in uh, to the uh, computer vision. Uh, so uh, these filters are much more useful than the Instagram filters because they are specifically engineered so they can extract useful features from an image. For example, this filter here, because it has this minus once and once oriented vertically, is able to emphasize the vertical edges uh, of, the, of an image. And if you just transpose it, like turn it around, uh, you will get a filter uh, that, uh, that does uh, extraction of the horizontal edges. And by applying these kind of filters, uh, and these are applied, maybe if you remember from your like, signal processing courses, by, by, con by uh, operation of convolution uh, with, with the source signal, uh, you can actually extract these useful features, which are like edges, uh, which are like corners, which are like colored blobs. And by extracting those features and then combining them in higher level reasoning, you actually uh, uh, get to the point where you can actually uh, see that something is a face or something is not a face or whichever uh, kind of problem you have. Uh, also, these filters can be represented uh, as images. So maybe uh, this uh, darker color can represent uh, lower numbers and lighter can represent higher numbers. Uh, and now I'll just show you some real-world filters. So these filters here uh, are hand-engineered filters. They were engineered by humans, by scientists and engineers. And also, it's, it has been proven that these kind of filters exist inside your uh, eye cells. So pretty much impulse response of your eye cells are a, a kind to these filters. These filters are called Gabor filters. Actually, these are like somehow oriented Gabor filters. So this is like a Gabor filter, a different orientation, and a different scales. Uh, but these filters are made by humans, so they were engineered. On the other hand, here are the learned filters. These filters were learned by a deep neural network that does representation learning. And what's interesting here, and that is like totally amazing to me, this is like a result from 2014, and I cite it every, uh, every day, uh, is that if I show you side by side, you can actually see that an, uh, a deep model, convolutional model, actually learned just from data, from scratch, without human intervention, that to, uh, to actually that it is a good idea to use these kind of Gabor filters which we already knew were good. So they are everywhere there. This is like a second one, and also, but there are also other filters there. So for example, this like this filter which does uh, detection of color blobs and so on. So uh, the, the, the main thing here is that these representations are learned. And that, that's the whole point. Even though, uh, and, and what's the most important thing, that now that you also have some like, knowledge of what are Gabor filters and what is cl classical uh, signal processing, you can actually understand that these representations that are learned are also meaningful, which is a good indication to you that the model you're building is somehow uh, uh, performing well. Uh, so I'm just going to emphasize those points again, because now when the model learns the representation, it actually makes it easier for you to understand it. And on the other hand, uh, if you do some experiments and run this, you will see that these learned representations are much more powerful than the, the representations when you as an engineer sit down and try to engineer which, which is a good one. Furthermore, uh, as I said, uh, you really have to understand what the model learns in order to improve it. And I will immediately give you an example. For example, look at this filter here. Uh, this filter was learned, but it is flat. 
It, it has pretty much no features in it. Uh, and if you remember, like your your math three course, maybe uh, 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 convolving with a flat filter. Uh, is an identity operation, meaning it does nothing. So this filter here is totally useless because it's flat. And also uh, that holds for this one and also holds for this one. So you can see that this, 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 this deep neural network actually learned some representations which are totally useless. And that's what you want to avoid. And when you see that, a red light comes into your head and you start to improve your model. And actually this model was improved uh, uh, two years later and uh, on the improved model we have these kind of representations. Now we have none of those uh, ugly, useless flat filters. So this kind of, uh, of a mindset in which uh, uh, machine learning scientists would think about when try, trying to improve such a model. Uh, so, but this is just, just like a tip of an iceberg. Uh, this is the whole uh, AlexNet uh, deep convolutional neural network. It's a huge network. And what I was talking about until, up until now is only this first layer. So it took me like 15 minutes. Now we'll be here for one more hour until I got through all those layers up ahead. I'm just joking. So what are these uh, higher level representations? That, that's the, the question. And it so happens that it's actually also possible to tap into those higher level representations and understand uh, what goes beyond this first, first level of, of convolutions there. So, pretty much it looks like this. To, to do this kind of visualizations, it's much harder than those previous. But anyway, some smart, smart scientists did it already for us. So what we can see here, uh, each of these three by three blocks is a representation of what a single neuron inside the neural network has learned. Uh, given an input on this side. For example, this neuron learned to find some kind, some kind of shape, uh, rounded shapes, or some kind of vertical horizontal lines, or flat patterns, or whatever. And if you go a level higher, this is like a, a layer tree, we now have even more richer representations, because uh, what, what the deep model does is it actually aggregates and does hierarchical re reasoning by aggregating more and more complex uh, uh, features in order to get to a high-level reasoning. For example, in layer tree, we already have a, a single neuron which is pretty much specialized in actually activating when it sees faces. And the other, other hand, maybe his, his first neighbor is specialized in detecting patterns which look like text, even though they can be windows or barcodes, but they look like text. And now we go even level higher, we get something like legs of a birds and very, very high level specialization. And then we go even level higher on level five, layer five, we now can detect, uh, we have neurons which are specialized in uh, acti activating where they see like uh, dog faces, cat faces, where they see m monocycle wheels or whatever you like. And it's like totally amazing. And it's really easy to see when you have this kind of methods of what is your model learning and what is a red light to you. If you see that here we have a flat representation in layer five, then you're definitely doing something wrong. You must, you must to have these rich representations in order for your model to be working. And here I'm actually using a lot of examples from computer vision. I did this intentionally because computer vision is uh, very easy to understand. It's intuitive, really, because you see, you do it every day. Uh, the humans are best at it. Like the, no, no, no algorithm is better than humans in visual perception. Uh, and so for you, it's easy to understand these images. But what I actually do for like a, a year at TomTom Tom is analyzing this kind of data. This is like a location data. You pretty much can understand it like uh, GPS traces of whatever, of cars, dogs, vehicles, whatever you like. And this kind of data is different. So the question is, can, can we actually, uh, we can actually, that's a known fact, uh, implement representational learning. It is, is this like a new domain, which is not, not a visual domain. So uh, we, we usually can do that. Uh, but the problem here is that the images are, as I said, intuitive. And on the other hand, this location data is sparse and it is pretty much non-intuitive to understand. So these models are not so advanced because it's very hard to develop a technique to understand what would you like deep, it, uh, usually we use here like recurrent models, what your deep recurrent neural network would, should learn from this kind of, uh, of location data. So I will just give you an example of how you might, uh, of, of or some kind of real problem and see how can we come to some kind of understanding of what those models learn. So firstly, 
let me let me define you a data set and a task. So uh, there exists uh, some kind of a public data set. It's really pub public. It's called MIT Reality Mining Data Set. Uh, I'm actually not allowed to talk uh, uh, about company stuff, but I'm using this uh, public data set as an example. Uh, so uh, here, this data set inside of it has uh, GPS locations, let's say, something like that, of university students and staff members of some kind of probably MIT university. Uh, and w what you have there is for each user, or as they call it, participant, uh, at each day and in e each hour of each day, you have a semantical location of, of theirs. So you, you have uh, where, uh, at 9 a.m. 9 they are home, then at 10 they are at work, then at 11 they are at work. So for each hour, you have their, their location there. And just imagine that from some kind of business reason, you, you want to solve this task. You want to, to, based on this location data, create a deep learning model which will discriminate which of the users are staff members, like professors, uh, scientists, and so on, and which are like students, like undergraduates or whatever. I say that you want to solve this problem. Uh, and I will use uh, this as like a simple example to, to give you an idea how can you also do, do representation learning in domain which is not so intuitive, let's say. So, uh, uh, what you see here is that you actually uh, need to somehow represent this data that you have as an input. It's like, it's a discrete data set. So pretty much what would you do is uh, say, okay, uh, I have days within a week, which I can index from zero to six, and then I have weeks within a year, which I'll index from zero to 51. This is effectively your date. It's uh, the simplest way to, to encode the date. And you can also say that uh, I have hours within a day, and maybe let's say that we have in total four possible locations for the users. Uh, so in total, if we uh, sum this up, we have 86 dimensional binary input space. So uh, your task as a data uh, learning uh, and a machine learning engineer is uh, to take this 86 dimensional binary uh, vector and process it by your model and then uh, provide some kind of classification at the output. And that classification should be whether a user is like university student or is a staff member. And then if you apply representation learning, I'm, I'm, I don't have here uh, time to go into how would you do this, but I, I will give you what, what can be the result of it. So, uh, so if you apply representation learning, what you, your model might do, and so just remember in representation learning, you don't engineer any features. You just make nice environments such that your models can flourish and learn the representation by itself. So your model might decide that a good representation, a good idea might be to map each day within a week uh, to uh, some kind of R10 uh, vector. Uh, this is just like a fancy way of saying to map it to an array of, of doubles of length 10. So it might map uh, those days within a week to some kind of, uh, of vectors. And here, uh, these vectors are actually your representations. These numbers here are not engineered by you. They are actually uh, learned from the data themselves. And what you want to understand is why the heck did your model learn these numbers and not some other numbers, let's say. And there are like a variety of methods how you can do this, but I here will show you just something which is like really visually pleasing. So, so you can see what, what kind of analysis you would need to do when, when really doing work with, with, with deep learning. Uh, so we kind of can imagine uh, that uh, this representation is a metric space. So that pretty much means that uh, there is some kind of math that we can do in order to measure a distance between these vectors. For example, you can measure how far is a Monday from Friday, or how far is a Friday from Sunday. It's like they should be like very far, probably. Uh, and then we can see if those, uh, those distances in between days within a week are in any way meaningful. So this is like some kind of a detective task, if you like. So. Uh, this is like this is like a real result from it. Uh, uh, what we have here is seven by seven matrix representing seven days within a week versus other seven days within a week. And uh, what's interesting there is that now we can see in colors here shown, uh, we can see uh, how distant are uh, days among each other. You have a color bar on the side. So let, let me just walk you through this. Uh, here uh, we have. 
uh, in the first row, it represents Monday. So we can see how far is Monday from the other days within a week. And what, what you can see here is that Monday is somewhat close to the first five days, but then Saturday and Sunday are somehow very distant from, 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 from the Monday. It actually holds uh, for all the weekdays. And this kind of, it's actually pretty reasonable uh, that this, this deep learning model from data has learned that from some reason, which seems for me at least quite logical, that it should separate uh, weekdays and weekends. And this sounds really useful because there is definitely a different way of reasoning when you have data that happens on weekends and then you have data that happens on weekdays. And what's in it, it, it is interesting that this model actually learned this from data uh, without of any like human intervention. Uh, also, you can see that this model learned uh, that uh, Saturday and Sunday are actually quite similar and, and the distance between those two vectors uh, is very close. And on the other hand, it has learned that uh, all the weekdays are somewhat similar. And you can see uh, these, these here dark brown are zeros, pretty much Monday is, is exactly the same as Monday uh, and so on. So uh, the, the point here is that when, when, whenever you actually do any kind of deep representation learning, you really have to give your best to understand uh, what the heck is your model learning. Because uh, um, in, other, in other regards, if you do it otherwise, you just uh, treat it as a black box, what you're really going to do is underperform on those tasks. And the companies that are best at providing deep learning solutions have engineers that actually uh, use these kind of tools and this kind of reasoning to really understand what models learn in order to make them perform the best possible. So pretty much the conclusion here would be that you should uh, learn your presentations and don't really handcraft them. So, thank you. I think we have like a minute or two for, for a question, yeah? If there's any question, please, also I'm available today here, so we can talk if you liked uh, this kind of, of talk. Okay, great, thanks.